What a great couple of pieces of music to help us to focus on the Lord and then to, to have God speak to our heart and our soul. Are you glad that you came this morning, yes or no? All right, I am too. I am thrilled. And thank you all for, for blessing us and thank you choir for helping us to sing the hymns. Thank you all that have uh, once again braved the, uh, the Arctic uh, blast to be here. And uh, today was even more complicated than normal, so let me just talk to you as friends. Um, in the, the Family Life Center, the gymnasium where we typically have the first service, the heat wasn't working properly, so we had to move them all into here right before this service. And that was crazy, and so thank you for your patience if you were coming in a little earlier and like, whoa, what's going on? And then we had to call a, a squad for, for one of our ladies this morning um, as we were trying to start the service. And so, um, so um, please... Please keep Cheryl Jones in your prayers uh, as well. I think she'll be fine, and, and I think we'll be all right. But at the same time, we need to, to keep her in our prayers. Um, and then also, and I'll put out a one call about this, but um, Phyllis Kimmel, who is a wonderful blessing here for years and years, um, she passed away, and they're doing the, we are doing the service here this coming uh, uh, Saturday at 1130. So we want to keep the Kimmel family in prayer. And we ought to keep each other in prayer as well. Um, I know we're fighting illnesses and craziness, and, uh, and then at the same time, some of us have lost loved ones very recently, and so um, we want to love each other, and so I'm going to give you the opportunity to do that today, um, and so, uh, so we'll try to encourage each other here in a little bit, and then after the service, um, uh, if you ordered a poinsettia and didn't take it yet, you're certainly welcome to take it now, and, uh, and after the service, if, if those that have purchased them have already taken them, we want to take the rest to people in need, uh, whether it's just a need of, of friendship, encouragement, somebody that's homebound, nursing home, something like that. So if you know somebody, you don't need our permission. Just take one and take it to them. Is that, is that okay? Um, you know, so if, if, if you're inspired to do so, do it. Um, all right. So um, friendship revolution uh, is something that started last Sunday. I know later on it'll be on CNBC and Fox News and stuff, but we started it last Sunday right here at, at Columbia Heights. And, uh, and, and, you know, and so we've got kind of this image of a couple of hands just kind of being like, yeah, I'm with you, I love you, I'm supporting you, uh, and I'm going to try to be your friend. But at the same time, we recognize that friendship isn't the easiest thing in the world, is it? Uh, we just went through an election cycle where some people had strain on friendships and family relationships over politics. Was that any of you all? Did any of you experience that? You know, somebody kind of, you know, yeah. I mean, a lot of us, it was a, a stressful kind of thing, and it may have continued. Um, and so I want to just kind of think about friendship, because in a minute, not right this minute, but in a, in a minute, we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 7 in the Bible. But to, to kind of get at this, let me just give you a, a recap of last Sunday, for those of you that weren't here. And then I'll be emailing out a link to a particular study that I talked about. So here's the, the 60 second overview. Jesus himself, when asked what's the most important thing to do, he said the most important thing is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. He put them together. It sounds like two things, but he said really it's one thing that's point A and point B. You have to love God. That's what we're called to do as, as humans that have been created by God. But we've been created to be in community and care for one another, have relationships and friendships, and so we've got to love one another. Jesus said that, not me. It's not my opinion. It's him. Love God. Love. And then we found out that there was a Harvard study that's gone on for 75 years that definitively in social science, that world has shown that to be happy, it's mainly based on your relationships. You have good relationships, then at the end of your life, you say, yeah, this has been a pretty happy life. If, you'd had, if you didn't have some close very good friendship, relationships, those types of things, you're not going to be happy. To the point that the study said they could, they could more definitively decide and predict whether a 50-year-old male was going to be healthy in all different ways at 80 by looking at does that 50-year-old male have some close friendships, relationships, you know, whether it's spouse or not, whether it's just friends, that's a huge indicator. It's even more of an indicator than your cholesterol level or any of those other medical things. It's bizarre that it's that powerful in our lives, but it's true. And it, it makes sense from what Jesus said. Loving people, non-negotiable. We've got to do it. We need it. We all need it. And I shared as well, and let me build on that right now. 
even the most introverted of us, who really like being alone sometimes. You don't have to raise your hand, but don't, don't some of you like being alone, having your alone time sometimes? Yeah. I was talking with somebody this week, and they're like, and I said, you know, if you were kind of stuck in the hospital for a month or two and nobody came to see you and you're just by yourself, that'd be horrible. And, and she said, well, <laughs> you know, I mean, I admit I'm kind of introverted. I kind of like my alone time and that kind of stuff. But, but we both, you know, we both realize that, yeah, there will come a breaking point at which if you're alone and you like being alone, that's different from being lonely. And even the most introverted of us will eventually get lonely if we don't have good relationships or friendships. At the same time, this isn't easy, is it? To have a good relationship, a good friendship. I mean, this is not easy at all. Uh, to have a great friendship last 30 years, that takes serious effort, doesn't it? Like, that is really, really difficult. It's very, very tough to be able to do that. Um, and so, uh, I admit, it's not easy, and we want to get to Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to talk about judging, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some caveats, all right? So, the judging, not judging, is, is different from what you may think that I'm going to say, okay? So, if, if, you, if you stick with me looking here, because discerning is very different from judging. Judging has to do with hypocrisy. Discerning means we do need to figure out right, wrong, good, evil, those types of things, even safe and unsafe. So let's, let's try to put this together. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 5. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye and then you'll be able to see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Hmm. Now, the teenage Nathan, <clears throat> teenage Nathan back in the day when Jesus says, do not judge, the teenage Nathan might have said, yeah, but judging's kind of fun. Well, kind of sarcastic, right? And I'd point out, you know, different things and kind of be argumentative a little bit. Were any of you all like that back in the day? Are any of you still like that? You want to admit it right now? Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. Now, judging other people, we do that all the time with our sports. If you're an Ohio State Buckeye fan, along with a bunch of others in the Ohio Stadium, and Michigan comes in to the stadium, do you go, oh, cheerio, we love you. Play well, mates. You know, no, we don't do that. In our minds, are they going boo? And, and it goes both ways. We go to the big house in Michigan, you know, full of Michigan fans, and you're the Ohio State fan, or you're the Ohio State Buckeyes coming out on the field. Um, you're not feeling a lot of love, right? You, you know, you're feeling some judgment. You know, that, but that's a that's a kind of a healthy thing. It can be, but sometimes people will allow that to drive wedges in friendships, won't it? But even more important than that might be something like um, the mean girls syndrome. Any of you all ever encounter mean girls growing up? Were any of you, some of you mean girls yourselves? Do you want to confess right now? No. What's a mean girl? That's that's when they start picking on the others, right? And they make some girls outcasts. And I was with a a friend at a, a basketball game recently. And he saw some of the other students videoing other students. And he said, how hard would it be to be a student in today's world? Because you do something stupid or embarrassing or you mess up, and all of a sudden it's all over the Internet. Judgment, right? Look how stupid this is and picking on each other. But is it only for young people? No way. It happens in offices. It happens in nursing homes. I mean, you know, judging other people. And then the in crowd that judges the outcasts, then you have a subculture of outcasts, don't you? Were some of you all kind of the outcast kids? And they kind of band together, and then you look down on the snobs, right? Or the the mean girls, or or the the jocks that picked on you and gave you swirlies. Anybody get a swirly back in the day? You know, uh, some of you are like, what is that? Um, we'll, get, we'll get some of the ushers to give you swirlies after the service unless you experience that. It's not a good phenomenon, right? Judging one another, looking down on one another, that's a little different from just having nice sportsmanship, right? And so th- let's, let's kind of pick this apart and figure out what is Jesus getting at? 
Because don't judge me. When people say that, sometimes they have thoughts that are not exactly what Jesus meant. So let me, let me show you what I mean. Do not judge or you too will be judged. This isn't just friendly banter rooting for your team. Um, let me give you an example of what this, I think, looks like, and you, you then be the judge, okay? Uh, my wife Jennifer has a Facebook friend from high school way back when who hates Rob Portman. Rob Portman is who? State senator, right? He hates Rob Portman. Anytime Rob Portman says anything public or makes a vote that is, is known, um, this guy gets on the internet and says something bad about Rob Portman. And it's scathingly bad. Picking on him, making fun of him, you know, accusing him of horrible, horrible things. He just hates. And so almost every other post that this guy posts on Facebook, you know, types out on Facebook, is negative toward Rob Portman. Now, he's judging Rob Portman, so guess what Jesus would say? He then says, for in the same way that you judge others, you will be judged, and the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Jennifer and I see this among her other Facebook friends that look at this guy, and they then assume, man, that's a really hateful guy. What an idiot, right? They do not look at him and say, wow, what an astute political analyst, <laughs> right? No way. They, they judge him. So he's judging others, then he's getting judged, and it just goes on and on and on, doesn't it? And, and that happens in, in life. So do not judge or you will be judged. And you're probably going to be judged by the same way. And maybe even God in some way. But, but we're just talking just kind of proverbial in the world that happens. You're going to get judged. So don't be a judgmental person. But what does that really mean? What does that mean? Do we judge other people like what Jesus is talking about? Man, I hope not, but it's easy to do sometimes. And maybe you feel like people are judging you in different ways. So let's dive in then a little bit more to this scripture and let Jesus interpret himself. So his interpretation of what it means to judge is described by verses 3, 4, and 5. Here's verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? Plank, let's think... Arg, matey, walk the plank, right? Now that's going to help because that's a big piece of wood, right? That's not a speck of sawdust. So, verse 4, how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Now, if Jesus was a carpenter, What's that do to the story for you, mentally? It's just hit me very recently. Carpenter, you're doing something for somebody else. So let's say you're making a table for somebody in need. They can't afford a table. You find out about it. You're a carpenter. You can make a really amazing table out of wood, right? But when you do so, you're going to get some sawdust on you, probably. You got sawdust all over you. You get a little speck of sawdust in your eye. But you were doing good, but yet you got this imperfect environment. You weren't wearing your safety glasses. I know all of you men always wear safety glasses whenever you use tools, right? Good. Did you lie in church just now? Anybody? Anybody? I can't judge you. You know, sometimes I, you know. All right, so you've got dust in your eye, sawdust in your eye, and then somebody comes in and starts picking on you, and they've got a plank sticking out of their eye. You loser, look at what you've got in your eye. You loser. But they've got this big plank sticking out. Wait, that's... That's the kind of judging that's a ridiculous kind of judgment, but we as humans, and we're broken, we're sinful sometimes, we, we contend into that looking down on somebody else when we haven't really even checked every aspect of our own heart. But at the same time, there is a perversion. There are actually two different ways that I see this perverted in terms of interpreting Jesus. I'm not saying Jesus is perverted. I'm saying that people can take what he says and pervert it so when somebody says to you, don't judge me, you shouldn't be judging, don't be judgmental, sometimes it can be interpreted in a couple of, in my opinion, wrong ways. And then let me give you my opinion, let you measure it against how Jesus interpreted it. So for instance, one perversion of what Jesus teaches here and other places that I've seen is when people say that you then should allow yourself to be a victim or victimized because otherwise, you're, you're judging other people. 
Let me give an example. Is a right interpretation of Jesus' words to say that, you know, if you're a woman and your car breaks down and you're walking down the street and you see this guy standing in your path and he's not moving, and you may not be able to, to, uh, to, to tell, but in this picture he's got something hanging out of his hand. He has something in his hand and he's standing there. Are you judging him in Jesus' meaning if you decide, I don't think I should walk down that road? Are you judging him? Mm, now that's a loaded question, isn't it? That's a loaded question, okay? Because at that moment, you're trying to figure out, would it be prudent? Would it be street smart? Would it be wise? Would it be shrewd of me to just go up to him and say, hey man, brother in Christ, I love you. Do you need anything? Is, would that be Jesus' expectation? And I've had people seem to indicate that that would be Jesus' expectation. And so then I, I talk with different women who feel f- what I would call false guilt when sometimes they're making a decision that truly is for their own safety. This is a big guy. He's not moving, and he has a weapon in his hand. <laughs> okay? Now, at that point, that seems to be a very different environment than a guy has a speck in his eye, another guy comes in who has a big plank in his eye, and that guy with a plank is trying to get the speck out of that. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? Like, that's a very, very different situation. Let me give you another thing that Jesus said and try to put these two things together. Jesus says in just a few more chapters, in chapter 10, verse 16, I am sending you, Christ followers, Jesus followers, I am sending you out like sheep among what? Wolves. Are there wolves out there? Yeah, there are. I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, and this is one of the most bizarre things Jesus says, but look at this, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Oh, I, I probably should preach on this a little bit more. Other Christians should maybe know this passage a little bit more because we have all these people that feel very, very guilty out there when they don't stop to help somebody, but it's four guys in a car with a cell phone (laughs) and you're the one lady in the car by yourself. Should you feel guilty for not stopping? And I have people all the time that are like, man, I really, I struggle with that. I feel like I'm not being like Jesus. Well, is that not being like Jesus or is that being like Jesus? Are you being kind of as shrewd as a snake? That's a weird thing for Jesus to say, but Jesus said it. I'm not making this up. Check your own Bible. Be a shrewd. Be be shrewd, but be innocent. Be innocent. Hmm. At the same time, there are other settings where you may be led to to help, but you're judging the other person and don't want to help. I don't want to help. I I love the commercial where it's like sports team. It's somebody with sports insignias on their car and it breaks down. Or or they they stage it, don't they? They're they're saying, okay, we, we broke down. And will the other people that are other fans of other teams stop to help us? You know, that's, that's kind of a different thing than you're completely vulnerable. Should you be as shrewd as a snake, even though you're as innocent as a dove? Let me give you another example. Let's flip it the other direction. There are people that I've seen that have said that by not judging others, what that means is you should be totally okay with anything that other person does. And if you're not, then you're judging them. Okay? So you should have no standards toward other people. You, you should never try to correct somebody else. You should never, ever tell them that what they're doing is wrong. You should never, ever do that because that's judging them. There's a quote that I found on the Internet that's like that. Guys, would you go to the next slide? Nothing is true. Everything is permitted. You can just do it. Is that what Jesus is saying that your attitude should be toward other people? I don't think there's a right or wrong. I don't think there's good or bad. I just accept everything that you do. I just accept it. You should accept everything that I do. And if you tell me that I'm doing anything wrong, you're being judgmental. Have you heard people interpret Jesus like that? I have. I have. Is that what Jesus is saying? Mm, well, let's look exactly at what Jesus said. Jesus says that it's hypocrisy. There's a getting a speck out of an eye. So look what this says. He says, you hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to... Let's have some fun. Let's let you all read this with me, these last two lines, starting with remove. 
All right? Watch, watch what this feels like. Okay, let's read this together out loud. Remove the speck from your brother's eye. That's, ah, that's interesting. Your responsibility to people you love includes helping get that speck out of their eye. But there's an order in which you do it. And the first order is get your own big sins taken care of and clean up yourself because otherwise you're walking around smacking other people with your own sinful behavior while you're trying to pick on them for something that might be very minor. That's hypocrisy. It would be interesting. I won't ask you to, to raise your hand, but just kind of look at me with, a, with an aff- affirming look if this is true for you. Did, were you raised in a, a setting where you saw Christians not act Christian, so going to church in later years was difficult for you? And if you have, like, a parent, you know, somebody like that, they would go to church, and they seem to be all squeaky clean, and then they beat the snot out of you at home, or they did this or that at home, and you were like, wait, you're not, you're not living up to what you're doing, and that hurts you, Okay? Now, that's an interesting situation. Hypocrisy is what Jesus is talking about. Not an understanding that there is a right and a wrong. And more than that, if you really love me, there will be times where I do have that speck in my eye and I do need you to come to me and say, you've got a speck. I love you and you know that I'm having to deal with my own planks. You know that. So Nathan, I'm not picking on you and I don't think that I'm better than you. I'm not looking down on you. But brother, you've got that speck and I want to help you. Now, the minute I say that, there are those of us that are like, wait, isn't that judging? Well, not if you're doing it with that first take the plank out of your eye, then get the speck out of the other person's eye. Because if I'm doing something that hurts my kids, and you don't call me out on it, do you really love me? And you just let me do it? Do you love me? And you all talk about it behind the scenes. But nobody comes to me and says, Nathan, that's not a good thing that you're doing. That's hurting them. That's not really love, is it? But our culture seems to say, yeah, that's what you should do, because otherwise you're being judgmental. Ooh, this is hard, isn't it? All right, so let's make it practical. Let's make it practical. I'm giving you a lot to talk about. And you can, you know, I mean, over lunch, man, you guys could just be like, ah, I don't know. So let me, let me make it practical, and let's, let's, say, let's say that there's an ABC to trying to make friendship and try to care about other people where you're not judging them, but you are being as shrewd as a snake and as innocent as a dove, okay? And you're not being hypocritical because you know that you've got your own problems, but you don't want your problems to prevent you from loving that other person, right? I mean, I... I really like the Bengals, and we're having a rough year. So for me to go and talk football with a Steelers fan is hard because they're doing better than us. But I can't let that break down my relationship, and that's a way, way minor thing than who did you vote for, how do you spend your money, you know, right? I mean, those are very, very tough things. So can I go to somebody, can I go to Bob and say, I accept you, regardless of knowing anything about Bob? Can I say, I accept you, brother? I really do. I accept you. You know, can I go to Jane and say, Jane, I accept you? I really do. I really do, and I may not know anything about Jane. She might have voted for the wrong person in the election. I, don't, I might have voted for the wrong person in the election, right? But that's irrelevant at this level of acceptance. I don't have to agree with you on anything. I don't have to approve of anything that you do to accept you. I do have to approve if we're going to go and do it, <laughs> do the same thing, you know what I'm talking about, you know? But to accept somebody's soul as important to accept them as loved by God, I would say you don't have to agree with anything they do, but you can still love them and accept them. So I want you to, and and I'm doing this with my hands for a very, very important reason. I'm trying to be as innocent as a dove, but as shrewd as a snake. Is this very threatening? Wayne, do you feel threatened if I'm like this to you? No. If I was like this, I accept you, Wayne. Is that, you know? I accept you, you know, is that the karate kid, right? You know, uh, some, some violent whatever. But this, this is kind of more like Jesus, right? I, I do accept you. I do accept you. Um, at the same time, hey, Josh, I, I need to ask you a question, okay? All right. You, you, you with me? All right, all right. Um, 
uh, Josh, you um, SWAT team, right, sometimes? Sort of. A different type. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I use that because that, that lets you know it's a little different thing. If you're dealing drugs, you need to come to Jesus right now and talk to him in this setting. You do not want him showing up at your house. Okay? <laughs> right? Where's the police department? Josh, if you and I are face-to-face, okay, and I'm like this, and I don't know you, but I'm like this, how many different ways could I strike you if you're trying to hurt me from this position right here right now? What'd you say? Plenty. So if somebody were coming up to you threatening you, and you go like this, and you say, I accept you, can you defend yourself? I kind of like to do that and have him come up here and have his hands like this and then try to hit him and let you see what would happen, right? But I know how that would go down, right? Because I've seen the self-defense stuff, right? And some of you have taken self-defense lessons and you know that this is actually a powerful position. I can strike you in at least five different ways that I'm aware of where I could knock you out from this position. But I accept you, but I'm not being stupid. I'm being street smart. I mean shrewd as a snake. What's that look like in real life? It means that your server, you can accept them and say, I accept you, even if they're a horrible server. But you accept them as a person. I care about you. I accept you. The person that is on the side of the road, I accept you. I may not whip out my wallet and give you all of my money if I don't have it to give because I'm trying to save for my own kids because I'm in poverty myself. And Jesus is telling me at this moment that I should, I should keep, it, keep it for my, my kids. That sounds like you're judging them, but you can still accept them, I would say. I'm just giving you this to think about. As we interact with people, if this is somebody that I know has hurt other people, and I'm sorry, I just looked at this <laughs> way over No, that doesn't work either. Now you're going to think that Mark did something. Nobody did anything. That guy right there with the staff, right? You know, the, the shepherd. I accept you. I accept you, right? But at the same time, I know that they may try to hurt me, and I'm not just being stupid, but I am saying I accept you. See what that does to you, even in this setting, to say to other people, I accept you. So here's how we're going to end this. I just want to look around and say, I accept you. I'm going to invite you to bring your hands up like this, okay? Because that's also kind of defensive, but it's loving. I'm not, def- I'm not being violent. I'm not hurting somebody. But I have had people tell me, I have a friend who goes out and tries to love on people and all this stuff, and they just get broken, 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 broken. That person, for a period of time, may need to guard their heart a little bit and be as shrewd as as a snake. That's, that's a teaching of Jesus. I'm just offering that. I accept you. I accept you. So if you're willing, would you kind of look around to the people that are safe kind of around you and do this? Mark, I accept you. Isn't that cool? Now I know if I didn't have a cold, I could probably get a nice hug from Mark, right? I know that, right? I accept you. I, mean, my, I, I accept you, brother. I do. I accept you. I accept you. All right, let's, tr- let's try that again. I know it's weird. I know it's weird. I'll look over here at my boys. Hey, guys, I accept you. Say that to one another. I accept you. I accept you. I was about to kick this over. Tech crew, guys, I accept you. Thanks for accepting me. I accept you. Okay, there's going to be an A, B, C. This is the first one. What is it? I accept you. I recognize Jesus died for you. When we receive Holy Communion, I don't care if you're the worst, most immoral person in here. Jesus loves you as much as he loves me. Let me repeat that. The worst of us in here that's done the worst thing this past week, Jesus loves them as much as he loves us. He died for us. He was broken for us. His body is represented by the the bread. His body was broken for us. His blood, which is represented by the juice in the cup, his blood was shed for us. And Jesus said, no greater love has anyone than this, than they lay down their life for their friend. Jesus, we thank you for dying for us. 
and for wanting us as your friend. We thank you for dying for Judas even and wanting him him sitting at the table right there with Jesus. You still wanted him as your friend. Even though he rejected the offer, you wanted him as your friend. So Lord, help us to receive your acceptance and to accept one another with your love. We pray for your blessing on these elements, that they would be for us, the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We confess our sins. We confess we need you. Forgive us, restore us, and commune with us in this holy action. Amen.